good afternoon. I'd like to start this afternoon session by thanking uh, University Kebangsaan Malaysia for the kind invitation for me to give a talk to all of you. So this afternoon, my talk is called Malaysian Politics During COVID-19, The Search for Political Stability. So I will try to cover the following topics in order to explain what I mean by political stability and why political stability is such an important element of Malaysian politics. So I will say something about Malaysian politics since independence in 1957. Then I'll talk about the historic regime change in 2018, the second regime change in 2020, and of course we're living in the third regime change with the Ismail Sabri government. In the final part of my lecture, I'll talk about how do you explain the recent instability in Malaysian politics. And from there on, I'll draw some conclusions on the title of this talk, which is the search for political stability in Malaysian politics. So in this part, I'll talk about Malaysian politics since independence. And basically, as a very rough guide, you can divide it up into five different periods. The first period is when Malaya became independence in 1957, the creation of a new federation in 1963, up to the May 13th racial rise in 1969. Second period is essentially 1970 to 1981. And from 1981 to 2018, this is basically the period dominated by Mahathir and the post-Mahathir period. And from 2018 onwards, you have a search for a new model and a search for political stability. So if you look at the very first period from 1957 to 1969, you can argue that Malaysia was quite unique or Malaya at that time was quite unique. In that unlike many other countries around the world at that time or even in the region, Malaya negotiated its independence from the United Kingdom. Uh, there was no civil war, there was no war of independence. Uh, it was basically the elites of the Malayan political system who went to the UK and negotiated the independence. So that's the reason why you have lots of British institutions in place in Malaysia today, because there was a peaceful transfer of power. So the post-independence leader basically relied on the British institution. So the British were very influential, not only in the setup of politics in Malaysia, but also in a post-war period where many of the people that selected to be political leaders when they were in control took the reign of power in Malaya and later Malaysia. This was especially through the economy where it largely remained unchanged with most of the economy in foreign hands, especially in British hands. The British handed over power to a group of people called the Malay Alliance and this was supposedly representing the three major ethnic groups in Malaya. And that were the Chinese, the Indians, and of course the majority Malays. During this period, you can classify it as elite rule because in a sense, the ordinary people did not really take part in a political process. The political process was dominated by the political leaders in the Malay community, in the Chinese community, and in the Indian community. And therefore, it was all about elite bargaining among the elites of this Malay community, Chinese community, Indian community. Any issues, especially racial tensions or racial issues, were left to the leaders to resolve or negotiate behind closed doors. So as I mentioned earlier, Malaya became independent in 57, and a few years later in 1963, with the support of the British, Malaya became the Federation of Malaysia with the addition of Singapore, North Borneo or Sabah at this corner and Sarawak in 1963. During this time, there was of course a lot of tensions between Malaya and Singapore. And what was not known at that time was that around 1964, negotiations started between Lee Kuan Yew and Tugu Abdul Rahman for Singapore to leave the Federation and Singapore left the Malaysian Federation in 1965, again without bloodshed. And this is a major credit 
to the Malaysian political system. Now, of course, if you speak to most people in Malaysia, they will tell you that the most important political event after independence is, of course, 1969, what we might call a watershed moment when racial rights broke out in almost all the urban centers in Malaya. The country was placed under emergency rule under a thing called the National Operations Council. Parliament was suspended and all government bodies had to answer to this National Operations Council, which was essentially led by Tun Razak. Now this is important because Tun Razak was not the prime minister. The prime minister at that time was still Tunku Abdul Rahman. So this means that power was taken away from the elected leaders and put into this thing called the NOC. Now there is still a lot of academic debates about who started the riots, but what is not in dispute are the official view, which is that the riots were started because the Malay community were very unhappy with their share of the Malaysian economy. The official figure states that Malay shareholding or the corporate wealth of Malaysia at that time was about 2.4%. There was also a lot of poverty in the country and the overwhelming majority of those living in poverty were the Malay community. The second thing that is not in dispute is that after the racial rise, the political class, especially those in control through the National Operations Council, rejected the laissez-faire economic system. But more importantly, they also rejected the alliance model of government. They felt that the current political system, which is the 1957 to 69 political system, did not serve Malaysia very well because it led to a racial rise. The Malay elites decided to choose a different path. And basically they used the NOC to enforce its will on the whole country. So basically the NOC told all the elected leadership of the country, remember at this time parliament was suspended. They told all the MPs that parliament and normal politics can only resume if certain conditions were met. So from 1970 onwards until 1981, this is the period of Malay dominance, the new economic policy and Barisan national dominance. Now remember, in the last slide, I talked about certain conditions were made. So what are the conditions? One of the key conditions, of course, was Malay dominance. The second was the new economic policy. The new economic policy is really the world's longest social engineering program. Officially started in 1971, it is still going on today. Basically, it is a direct government intervention in the Malaysian economy on behalf of the Malays of Bumutra, and secondly, to lift as many people out of poverty as possible. Now, because of direct government intervention in the economy, the NEP has led to a lot of marginalization of the non-Malay population in Malaysia, and many of them accuse the NEP policies and NEP successor policies of institutional racism. The other very important condition in terms of Malay dominance, as I mentioned, is this constitutional amendment to restrict sensitive topics. Some of the sensitive topics are things like citizenship to the non-Malays, Assam Malayu as the national language, and of course, this whole idea of Malay dominance in Malaysian politics. The public face of Malay dominance became very clear towards 1973 two years after parliament was restored, when the Malay elite decided to restructure the Malay alliance to a completely new political vehicle called Barisan National or the National Alliance. It was very clear that the big difference between Barisan National and Malay Alliance is that the Barisan National was clearly based on Malay dominance and unknown dominance. To be fair to Tung Raza, initially he wanted a government of national unity, 
where all the major political parties in Malaysia were to join, although they will come under Malay dominance or under communal dominance. But parties like DAP and some parties in East Malaysia rejected this invitation. The Barisan national concept was based on a very, very simple idea that UMNO was first among equals. This means that at the end of every discussion it was UMNO who made the decision. This doesn't mean that the non-Malays could not take part. You could have an unlimited number of non-Malays or mixed parties in the coalition, but UMNO was first among equals. Basically, the idea is that from 1971 onwards, UMNO began to dominate all political institutions in Malaysia. Now we fast track to 1981 to 2018. This is the, probably the most important period in Malaysian politics. Uh, this was the period when we can argue that Mate completely reset Malaysian politics as we understand it. So Mate became prime minister in 1981 and he officially stepped down in 2003. He was very unusual in the sense that he was the first prime minister from a non-elite background. If you compare him to the three prime ministers before him, Ibn the Rahman, Razad and Hussein On, all of them went to the UK to get a law education. Mahathir instead went to Singapore, at that time the University of Singapore, where he did a medical degree. What was also very unusual about Mahathir was that his combined years in power, 22 years altogether, was more than all the his three predecessors. Remember from 63 to 1981, that's only 18 years. And Mate served as 22 years as the prime minister of Malaysia. What was really also interesting about him is that he was also the first prime minister of Malaysia to resign willingly. In this part of the world, once you achieve the number one political office, very often you try not to resign. People will have to push you to resign. But in Mahathir's case, he resigned willingly. There is no doubt that everything you see in Malaysia today can be linked back to the Mahathir years. So his imprint is on every aspect of Malaysian life and institution. But for me, the really interesting thing about Mahathir was that thus far, he is the only Malaysian prime minister that lay out his political philosophy clearly. He did this through a book he wrote in 1970 called The Malay Delana. So basically what were his core intentions when it comes to the country? I think when it comes to his core intentions for the country, you can basically break it into five core areas. First is that he wanted Malaysia to be a fully industrialized, developed country. He was clearly a man in a hurry. He really wanted Malaysia to be fully developed. And that's the reason why he launched many things like the industrialization policy, bring high-end engineering to Malaysia and all that. I think part of his push was that he wanted Malaysia to be as modern as Singapore because Lee Kuan Yew was contemporary and wanted to compete with Lee Kuan Yew. Secondly, I think his core intention was that he wanted Malays to be on par with the Chinese, especially in the economic arena. And third, he was very clear that he wanted the Malay community in Malaysia to practice modern Islam. In other words, if you read his book carefully and some of his speeches he made, he was very clear that his view of modern Islam is that it can coexist with modernity. So that's the reason why he has a long-standing dispute with the way past practices Islam. Fourth point, he wanted to change the mindset or the culture of the Malays. In his book, he made it very clear that he thought that one of the reasons why the Malays were not successful in the modern economy was because the Malay had very backward culture. And he wanted to change that, especially the mindset. And finally, he wanted to cement Ketuanan Melayu under UMNO. He was very clear that he wanted UMNO not only to be the first among equals, but he wanted all the institution of state, anything that he controlled, to reflect the fact that UMNO will always be in charge. 
To do this, basically, he centralized powers in, um, in the prime minister's office. But more importantly, especially after 10 years in office, you can see that power began to shift, interestingly enough, from Amno into his personal hands. It was also during the period when Mafe was in charge that we saw the widespread use of money politics. And money politics went hand in hand with the creation of a new class of Amno related businessmen, what the economy calls a rentier economy, or some people call it chronic businessmen. This was only successful because he managed to shift a large part of the agricultural economy to a modern manufacturing industrial base. So it provided a lot of opportunities for Malay businessmen that he picked to be successful. Many of the key infrastructure projects that you see in Malaysia today, things like the KLA, North-South Highway, Petronas Tower, all these were actually started by Mahathir. Now, early on, I talked about Mate having an issue with the way us preach Islam in Malaysia. Because of that, he was in high competition with PAS, not only as a political party, but in terms of ideology as well. PAS keep accusing Amno of being less Islamic. To counter that charge, he created a lot of Islamic institutions to compete with PAS. So for example, he strengthened Jakim and other Islamic agencies. He set up Islamic universities. The idea was that he wanted to project Amno as an Islamic champion equal to us. But the greatest legacy he did was that he brought in a lot of young Islamic leaders. And the best example of that is, of course, Anwar Ibrahim. Now, remember I said that his power became more personalized in the later part of his rule. This coincides with a period when he managed to marginalize the non-core Malay parties in the Barisan National, the MCA and the MIC. By the end of his rule, both these parties, which were supposed to represent the Malaysian Chinese and the Malaysian Indians, were totally marginalized. On the international front, of course, he put Malaysia on the map as he was seen as a successful outspoken leader from the developing world. What would be the legacy of Mate? I think the jury is still out, but I think no matter how you write about the Mate years, I think his legacy is very, very complex. He gave a series of very important interviews to Japanese newspaper after he retired. And he was asked, what is his greatest regret? He mentioned that his greatest regret was that he was unable to change the Malay mindset. Remember early on, I mentioned that he wanted the Malays to be a highly industrialized community. He was never able to do that. I think another legacy for historians to write about him is that he left a system that was very corrupted. It was corrupted by money politics. And because it was corrupted by money politics, it weakened democracy as well. Thirdly, I think he gave Islam a more prominent political role during his time. And that was really the start of political Islam in Malaysia. Although he physically changed the landscape of the country, he was unable to develop the mind of the Malaysian people. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, he cemented power in the UMNO. It was quite clear by the end of his rule in early 2000, nobody could challenge UMNO. Another legacy is that instead of choosing somebody who will build on his legacy, he chose the weaker successor. It was widely known that when Abdullah Badawi was chosen, Abdullah Badawi had the weakest level of support within the UMNO power structure. And I think Mahathir chose him primarily for that reason. Another sad legacy that he left was of course, the ratio and religious tensions have gotten worse during his time when he was in power. And of course, finally, during his time, Sabah and Sarab were totally marginalized in terms of his political agenda. And that's the reason why they're really, really unhappy with the Federation today.
Now let's quickly move on to the post Mahathir era. As I said earlier, he chose Abdullah Badawi to succeed him in 2003. Badawi of Pa'la was an extremely weak leader, but people liked him because he was seen as somebody very clean and corrupt free compared to the um, other UMNO contenders for the leadership of the prime ministership. In his first election, he won a very big political victory. Thus, he had big political capital, but he was unable to move or he moved too slowly in terms of political reforms. He did try very hard to undo many of Mahathir's policy and that caused some conflict with Mahathir. He tried to inject his own brand of Islam, Islam Hadari in 2004, but this was widely rejected by the Islamic political class in Malaysia. And therefore, it ended up as a massive failure. Of course, there was a lot of other things that he did that was not successful. So that's the reason why he was widely rejected by the voters in 2008. He did so badly that this was the first time Barista Nasher lost his two-thirds majority. From then on, he was forced to resign and Najib Razak took over as the prime minister a year later. Since then, Mate has consistently claimed that he supported Najib Razak to be the prime minister. In fact, it was his influence that made Najib Razak the prime minister. And he said that he chose him because of his father, the late Tum Razak. What is really interesting is that although Razak Sorry, although Najib Raza always positioned the Mahathir, he also tried to undo many of Mahathir's policy as well. So one of the first things he did when he came to power in 2009 was he tried to reform the NEP. He tried to set up a thing called the new economic model. And he tried to take away many of the Bumbutra policies, but he was not successful because of the strong opposition from Malay nationalist groups. In the later part of his rule, Najib was sidetracked by the 1 MDB crisis. This was very, very serious for Malaysia because what is not often reported in Malaysia is that because of the 1 MDB crisis, there was a big drop in foreign direct investment from the West. Because of that, Najib had to turn towards China. And Najib, interestingly, became one of the first Southeast Asian leaders to be a very strong supporter of the Belt and Road Initiative from China. At the same time, because he was losing political support in Malaya, he began to rely more and more on the Barisan National Parties in East Malaysia. So that's the reason why he rewarded East Malaysia with a Malaysia Day public holiday. Key positions were awarded to East Malaysians in cabinet and also in parliament. So for example, for the first time since independence, the speaker and the two deputy speakers of Dewan Raya were given to East Malaysians. It was also this period that Mahathir also fell out with Najib Razak. And he fell out with Najib Razak big time. In fact, the rift between them became so serious, Mahathir resigned from UMNO, set up a new party, Bersatu, and joined Pakatan Harapan, or set up Pakatan Harapan with Anwar Ibrahim to defeat uh, Najib. And of course, we know that he was successful because Barisan National under Najib Razak lost the Pakatan Harapan in 2018. What was really unusual in that campaign was that this was the first time the campaign featured the wife of the sitting prime minister. In all the previous electoral campaigns in Malaysia, nobody actually talks about the wife of the prime minister. But this time, Rosma played a major role in making sure that the Barisan National or UMNO was extremely unpopular. So let's look at the first regime change, the Pakatan Harapan government. So as I mentioned earlier, Mate switched to Pakatan Harapan, led it to victory, and there was a lot of hope and a lot of political capital in his hands because he engineered the first political regime change in Malaysia since independence. But the sad part is that his new government never really worked because the parties in Pakatan Harapan could not work together. We have to remember that this was a coalition put together quite quickly 
In other words, it was a coalition of convenience because everybody wanted to get rid of Najib and Barisan National because one NDB. And Mahathir also came in thinking that he will run the government similar to how he ran the government the first time around. In other words, in his mind, he was probably running a Barisan National 2.0 government. You have to remember that his party, Beswatu, consists almost exclusively of ex unknown members. So they had exactly the same philosophical basis and beliefs, political beliefs of UMNO. So on the one hand, you have Bersatu, who believes in Ketuanan Melayu, and on the other hand, your coalition partner, the DAP, wanted less racial and religious politics. Due to the short time they were in power, uh, they simply did not have any really successful policies. It's quite interesting that the Pakatan Halapan government did something that nobody thought was possible, which is they pushed AMNO and PAS to come together in a political alliance. AMNO and PAS tied up and they had a very effective narrative against the Pakatan Halapan government, which is that the Malays and Islam are marginalized by Pakatan Halapan. It was also during this time, not only was the Malay ground turning against the government, the civil service were also turning against the government because they were very unhappy with some of the DAP people in government. But the primary reason why everything fell apart was because Mahave did not want to hand power over Anwar. Initially, he promised to hand over Anwar, a power to Anwar after two years of government. But he refused to do it because we now know that he never had any intention of handing power over to Anwar. So when 2020 came, he was looking for a reset. He was trying to form a new coalition, minus Anwar and minus DAP. Now, I do not want to go into details of how he lost control during this period in forming the new government. But basically, the short story is that he lost control of the process and the new government was created by Muyadin Yassin. So Muyadin Yassin came to power in 2020, and this is the time of the second regime change. Muyadin Yassin called his government Perikatan National Government, even though it consists basically of only Malay parties. It's interesting that Muyadin Yassin also tried to replicate the Barisan National model, but this time we pass inside the government rather than pass attacking the government. This was also a government that went without a confidence vote and they did not win any general election. They were just put together and they were selected by the Agon to carry on as a new government. Because of this, the government was largely unstable from day one. And the major causes of the instability, of course, was the COVID-19 crisis. Secondly, they had a very, very small majority, less than five. And perhaps, most importantly, the government could never be stable because Muyadin was under tremendous pressure by Zahid and Najib. Zahid and Najib controlled the largest faction in UMNO and they were putting pressure on Muyadin to do something about the court cases they were facing. So during the rule of Pakatan Harapan, they instituted investigations into the previous government, the Najib administration. And Najib and Zahid were charged together with several UMNO leaders with basically maladministration, corruption and money laundering. And basically Najib and Zahid, the biggest fashion UMNO, wanted Muyadin to intervene and help them get away. Now, because of this tremendous pressure from Najib and Zahid, Muyadin really had no choice. Towards the end of his rule, he came under a lot of pressure from the palace. And when the palace intervened and said that the Muyadin government had lied to the palace, this was really the final straw that broke the political back of Perikatan National. He tried very hard to come to a late deal with Pakatan Harapan, but again, it didn't work. 
basically on the Pakatan side, they wanted the government to fall as well, because again, they thought they could make a comeback. But interestingly enough, even though that Muyedeng had all these political problems, his biggest legacy for a short government is actually the failure of his government to deal with COVID-19. So now we're in a third regime change. A new government was put together in August this year, and this is the Ismail Sabri government. The big difference between Ismail Sabri government and Muyedeng government is that Ismail Sabri has learned the key lessons from the Muyedeng regime. Huh? There's a spelling mistake that it should be lesson S E L E S S O N. <clears throat> so, what were the key lessons? You have to deal with the opposition because you have a small majority. And also within the government itself, you have to deal with Zahid and Najib because they have the ability to pull you down. So, that's the reason why, if you look at Ismail Sabri's government, his government is very cautious. The unspoken policy is almost like don't check the vote. So that's the reason why when he announced his cabinet, many people were very surprised. There was basically no change in the cabinet membership. As I said earlier, he knew he had to deal with the opposition because he had a very small majority, less than three. And that's the reason why he signed an MOU, the opposition to stay in power. Basically, the way to understand this is that this government is not interested in governing, it's only interested in retaining power in the next general election. So that's the reason why in the recent budget, there was a big allocation to the Malay population. So the way to understand is that this is very much an election budget. And of course, in terms of Zahid and Najib, he has dealt with them and there was every indication that he's working quietly behind the scene we help Zahid and Najib escape all the court judges. So how do we explain the recent instability? So if you look at the shape of governments in the last three or four years, you can see easily from 2018 onwards, Pakatan Harapan only served for 22 months. Perikatan National under Muyadin Yasing served for an even shorter term, only 17 months. And we know that Ismail Sabri will rule for at least 11 months. According to the MOU with the opposition, he should be able to stay in power until July 2022, next year. So let's look at the classic explanations for Malaysian politics. The first one is something that is very uh, popular, something that people speak about all the time, and that is ethnic conflict or ethnic politics. And that Malaysian politics is essentially a race competition or religious competition between the Malays and the non-Malays or the Muslim versus the non-Muslims. And it's primarily fueled by this ideology of Ketuana Melayu. The second popular explanation of Malaysian politics is of course that this is a class issue because things like race and religion are social construct by the ruling elite. They don't happen in the natural state. In other words, ethnicity, religion, all these are constructed by the state, especially by ruling elite, in order for them to manipulate the system to stay in power. Without race and religion, they have lost power many, many years ago, because then it will be a real conflict, which is between the rich and poor. Okay, so the other way of looking at it is that they're using the issue of race and they're using the issue of uh, Islam to stay in power by manipulating these two social constructs. The third popular explanation for Malaysian politics is that what we see in Malaysia is due to the institutional structure. It is due to the structure about how we hold Malaysian elections, how the mass media in the country is controlled or manipulated, how the economy, because NEP is a rainy economy, how the economy is skewed, how religion is manufactured and repackaged in such a way. They're all designed in such a way to retain the existing structure and to reinforce the existing political class. What is extremely important to understand about institutional structure analysis is that the basic structure we see in Malaysian politics today 
were all inherited from the British and colonial time. So in a way, you can argue that the same basic structures, uh, institutional structure that we saw during the British time with the white man at the very top has now been replaced by the Malay elite. And everything is basically the same. There were two other explanations for Malaysian politics. And that is that Malaysia is neither an authoritarian country, nor is it a full democracy. It is very much a hybrid state. In other words, there are many features of the Malaysian political system that has democracy. You can argue that Malaysia is one of the very few countries around the world that hold regular elections. But at the same time, it is also authoritarian in the sense that the elections are not free and fair. So you can see my point being a hybrid state. It is not fully democratic and it is not fully authoritarian as well. Another popular thing that you find in the literature of Malaysian politics is that you can also make quite a strong argument that what we're seeing in Malaysia today is that Malaysia is a country in transition. And that is once a country reach a level of development, you will have lots of political disruption before you move on to the next political plane. We saw this happening among some countries in Southeast Asia. We also saw it happening in Eastern Europe. It takes many years in terms of political transition before you move on to the next level. But in the meantime, there'll be a lot of disruptions in your political system. Now I come to the final part of my lecture, which is my own explanation of why we have political instability in Malaysia. My argument A is that the instability and the tensions we see in the Malaysian political system now is due to the fact that the Barisan national model has been there for so long. And now that it's no longer there, the system is trying to correct itself, bringing back elements of the Barisan national model. And also the fact that the Malay vote is split. These two issues are linked together. Now, remember the earlier part of my lecture when I talk about Malay politics. So essentially, prior to 2018, Malay politics was essentially a contest between two big Malay parties. One was called AMNO, the other was called PAS. There was no room for a third party. But since 2018, you can argue that the Malay political base has been divided into many different factions. AMNO is still there, but now you have Besatu and Mahathir. You also have PKR increasingly making a space for themselves in the Malay political space. And of course, past is still there. Okay. So although there's been no change in the Malay support for past, there has been a slight increase in Malay support for PKR. And of course, Amno vote is split between Amno and Besatu. Okay. And of course, the person behind is Mate. But now you have two additional new players trying to capture the Malay vote. One is Pejuang, Mate's news party, and of course, Muda. They're still in the process of getting registered, but they're after the Malay you vote. So remember I said earlier that the system is going to correct itself and pull back the essential elements of the Barisan National Model. Now, why is the system going to correct itself to the Barisan National Model? The reason is because under the Barisan National Model, the country experienced more than 50 years of political stability. So the system itself understands that this is probably the best system that we always had. And this system brought a lot of stability. And therefore, the people in the system wants a former Barisan national model to come back. Because like I said, the search is about political stability because of all the instability from 2018 onwards. So the question is that, what are the essentials of the Barisan national model? The essentials of the Barisan national model is basically that you have a coalition government where all the parties represent different ethnic groups, but within the Barisan National Coalition itself, you can only have one Malay dominant party, not more than one Malay dominant party. So if you look at Barisan National, at the height of Barisan National, there were 14 political parties in the Barisan National, but you only had one Malay party, Amno. And this translates into the government as well. 
the dominant Malay party is also the dominant player in government as well. Now, the dominant party as a whole tends to be more moderate on race and religious issue, and they will try to avoid conflict whenever possible because they want to pet the middle line. They always go to the middle of the political spectrum. They also are largely conservative and they believe in incremental change for Malaysian politics. So my argument is that the current instability is because we no longer have this Barisa national model. And the reason is because we don't have one dominant Malay party. So the analogy I like to use is that in the Malaysian political mountain, you can only support one tiger. You cannot support two tigers. Right now, you have two parties trying to kill each other, trying to be the dominant Malay party. One is Amno, one is Besatu. Okay, so which one of these will win? And if these two kill each other, does it mean that PKR will become the dominant Malay party? In order for PKR to become the dominant party, of course, is that he has to win the next general election. If PKR doesn't win, then the contest is back to Amno and Besatu. One of them must become the dominant party because the political mountain cannot support more than one tiger. My second explanation is that part of the reasons why we have a lot of instability in Malaysia is due to a thing called identity politics. Remember I spoke about Mahathir bringing in Islam and giving it a political space to work because he was in competition with us. Because of the foundation laid out by Mahathir during the time when he was in power, the Muslim population, especially the Malay Muslim population in Malaysia now, are much more socially conservative across all issues. Two things were also happening at the same time. One is the rise of bureaucratic Islam, where increasingly Islam is being bureaucratized by the system, all about rules and regulation. And this is clearly seen in the way the Shaira courts operate. And I would recommend a book by Tamim Mustafa. The other thing was happening at the same time uh, concurrently is the taking in of religious people into the state and creating an alliance with them, what we call the Ulama State Alliance, written by my friend Ahmad Guru, another important book. Now, remember, the Islamist element throughout the system have been emboldened. Why? Because they managed to pull down the Pakatan Harapan government 2018 because of this narrative they use. Malays and Islam are marginalized by the government. So in other words, we're talking about identity for all this. Huh? And the instability is caused basically by a very simple question. What is the vision for Malaysia government in the future or even now? Is this an Islamic government? Or is it a Malay government or a Malay Islamic government? Who is the core of the Islamic party in this country? Many people will say it's past, but, but I don't think so. Could it be Amno, Or could it even be Basatu? So there's a contested vision among the Islamist class in this country. And that in itself is causing a lot of political instability. And this is linked back to my earlier explanation about how because there's no one Malay dominant party, this has made the situation even worse. So in conclusion, political instability in the last few years in Malaysia has been made worse by COVID-19 and the government's very weak and bad policies towards the mitigation of the COVID-19. Some people call it incompetence. And if you look at what has happened since 2018, you will find elements of my explanation A and B both there if you look carefully. So going forward, how do you resolve these tensions? I think for the first one, it's relatively easy to resolve the tension because the general election is coming up very soon and the Malay community themselves will have to return a very clear winner. In other words, is it Amno, is it Besatu or even PKR? If the Malay vote is still split, then the instability will still carry on. Second one is much more difficult to resolve because we're talking about a philosophical or ideological battle. 
the Malay establishment of the Malay elite in Malaysia will have to agree on what role Islam will play in the public sphere. Right now, the Malay political class only agree on one thing. And that is Malaysia is neither secular, neither secular, nor is it an Islamic state. Thank you very much for your kind attention. If you're interested in what I've said in the last hour, I would highly recommend you go through this reading list. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.